is nothing else like drum and bass. It has spawned a whole world of subcultures, a whole world of genres. It's the real backbone of, of UK street music. Hold me tight, don't ever let me go. Drum and bass is so much faster than any other dance music. It's always been on an island. And because it's been on that island, you, you can't really taint it. Hold me tight, don't ever let me go. Don't ever let me go, don't ever let me go. Up all night, I die for you. I die for you. Hold me tight, don't ever let me go. It's like this tribal thing. It, it's like hypnotic. It just takes over me. And when I hear it, I just get into this sort of zone. Like I just lock into it. <laughs> You know, maybe metal pe metalers and rockers have a similar bond, but in other types of dance music, I'm not sure there's such a, a tight sort of lifelong obsession almost with, with anything as much as drum and bass. It can define a movement in drum and bass. I think it's basically is culture, isn't it? It started in like a city like where we are now in London, Bristol, Manchester, other big cities where it's very multicultural. You've got all these cultures kind of clashing almost. I like that rebel culture. It's that real, raw, rebel, we built this, it's ours, fuck you, I don't need you. It was a blend of different cultures. It was the bass lines from reggae music, the break beats from like hip hop. It was like um, toasting from sound system. It was rapping. It was all this UK culture all coming together under one roof. We were sort of born in a generation when that music was actually born. Yeah. You know, we yeah. saw the birth of, you know, hip hop. We saw the birth of house, yeah. techno. So, really lucky, so we've been yeah. really yeah. lucky yeah. to have been around during that time when yeah. all those musics not only were born, but with drum and bass, jungle, hardcore, it actually was this, Britain was the melting pot for it to become drum and bass. I think drum and bass kind of derived itself kind of from the hip hop strand, that DNA slightly. It was a bit more kind of beat led. Um, and I guess with most cultures as well, especially music culture, there's a defining it was also defined by the technology at the time. In 95, if I'm not mistaken, we just had like LTJ Bookham Horizons. I think that was 95. Goldie did Inner City Life. I think that was 95. And um, uh, I think Pulp Fiction as well. But they were all kind of quite melodic and, you know, and then I think 96, things started to get pushed in a different direction. 94, 95, 96, that kind of those golden years. That when you hear these tunes played and Randall's in the mix and it's just going off, it's just going off. And it's just going, it's just like a, that culture, man, is, it made us.
1996 was probably one of the most important years in, in British dance music. 1996 itself is definitely a favourite year for me, um, mainly due to what was coming out of Moving Shadow that year. They called it the summer of 96 and you had Storm from the East 1 and 2, which for me were huge records. Um, it was like early Easy Rollers, Hyperon Experience, um, James Jane Ritchie, Flytronics. Moving Shadow for me, 96, that was it. There was a lot of really cool weeklies going on when I first got into drum and bass. So there was a point sort of 95, 6-ish. I was going out Wednesday night to Swerve, which was Fabio's night. And that was, I mean, that's probably one of my absolute favorite drum and bass nights ever. Thursday would be Bar Rumba, so that would be more like the Bristol crew. That was where their sound really was, was coming up. Then Fridays and Saturdays would probably be something at the end, like Renegade Hardware. Um, and all Ram nights, and then also Saturdays, Metalheads were doing something at the Leisure Lounge for a while, which I loved. That some of my best drum and bass nights were there, just because it was it had more of a warehouse feel. It was a bit felt bigger to me, and and also that was the time when a lot of my tracks were getting played for the first time by like Goldie and Groove Rider and Fabio and Doc Scott and stuff. And then Sunday, of course, uh, the the Sunday sessions, Metalheads, Blue Note. <laughs> Yeah, it was a new energy that came into club, clubbing, man, and fortunately myself and Fabio were at the forefront of it. And that's kind of when uh, Goldie dropped Timeless, so everything was blowing up because he won some major award. And, you know, the whole club night kind of evolved from his album doing so well, nobody expected it, including myself. I mean, I didn't realise that Goldie would have that much commercial appeal. Putting it into the form of an album and Timeless being Timeless was really just a massive middle finger to people that never wanted to believe in the music. Why well, can't we make a record that's 21 minutes long? Who gives a fuck? I'm gonna make you fucking listen. From Goldie got signed with Timeless, then you know Majors come out with, oh we gotta have a Goldie, so they all start sniffing around. You know, I wasn't I was one of the last to sort of sign to a major. The record label with RCA at the time wanted me to be like the next Chemical Brothers. You know, you gotta understand if you go back to that era and look at an act like the Prodigy, go and look at all the me all their interviews with Liam, you know, he would always talk about me. You know, he was very influenced by me, my DJ, and I was very flattered, you know. I remember doing a gig for him, I think it might have been about 95, 96, and I DJ'd at Island Ilford. And as I was DJing, there's like a box behind, on the stage behind me, and they kept poking their heads out, going like this. But I thought they meant it, you know, like, all right, mate, like, wanker. So I'd be like playing to the crowd, look around and see me, I'd be like, oh, fuck off, and I kept telling them to piss off. And I was getting the ump, because I felt like they're, they're really taking a piss. And then afterwards, when I come off, they're like, why are you all annoyed, what's the matter? And I'm like, you lot standing there doing that. They're like, yeah, because we think you're good. In 1997, it was something that was a shock, not just for us, but for the whole scene. It was at that point when you just knew that this music was about to blow up. MTV got involved, they picked up the music, they started showing videos, people like Adam F was being on MTV, there was people like DJ Rap was being rotated, Groove Rider, and Fabio was on Radio 1. The thing was starting to really, you know, take life. Uh, you could see all these different kind of a&R guys coming to these gigs down at the end in London. They're there chucking money at, you know, they'll be signing an artist. I'm not going to name no one, but there were certain people getting deals that had never made a record in their life. Because at the same time, while this was all going on, I was also writing for, um, for a music magazine, so which was one of the big dance music monthlies in the UK at the time. So I could see, like, this whole progression where, like, you know, no one gave a shit 
and then like suddenly like everyone did give a shit and like you know it's, it was things like Blue Note and things like Speed where like I think the paper, the magazines were like you know well, you know before that drum bass was a bit like eh, you know kiddie music whatever, but then like but then it was like so many people were going and people were queuing outside the clubs and people yeah. from Japan people from everywhere everyone was going, trying to go out to these places and the music magazines couldn't ignore it. <laughs> Prototype years. The prototype was was an amazing uh, label at that time. It was like the flagship label in a way. I know we had Heads and Shadow and all. Yeah, that but stuff. Prototype was different. Groove Rider was the was the tastemaker, and that album, the Prototype Years, for me was why, when I knew I had to be a producer, I had to be making drum and bass. Just every single tune on there. It covered all styles. Yeah, it was incredible. It was mind-blowing. Yeah, Optical, Bad Company, Drum Sound and Bass Line Smith, um, Matrix, you know, brought, I didn't actually bring all these people into the game, but I hope, I would have liked to have thought I helped their careers along the, game, along the way, such as Bad Company and Fresh and all that, you know. When they brought me Planet Dust, it was like we were sitting in a cutting house, music house, and I just heard it and like, what's that? Oh, it's us. You know, and Fresh was sitting there. It's like, what are you saying? <laughs> Fresh prototype? Because, you know, I used to, you know, I'm still donning it. Don't get me wrong. If I want a tune, I'll get a tune. But back then, I was a bit of a bully, so I kind of bullied them into it. But um, it, we, we worked for everybody, though. You know, they, can't, they were doing their thing anyway, but that really set them off again. So, yeah, it was a good move. So anyone who was doing anything around there wanted to be on Metalheads or Prototype or one of those labels, you know? Yeah, they were just putting out record They were dominating the scene around then, really. I mean, they Maybe were putting they records out by on. Dillinger, right? What, yeah. what more can you ask for? We like, just, the guy was just laying the path for everyone else. I've always seen Dillinger as the master of drum and bass. He's like the professor. Dillinger Silver Blade. Uh, it's like Vangelis Blade Runner meets a horror movie. Like the balance of darkness and light is just, uh, he's just, he's like that. Dillinger's just amazing. What can I say? Dillinger's Silver Blade. This was like the ultimate in a dystopian, dark, twisted vision of the future encapsulated in music. Now, I learned a lot from Carl and um, that was a, a big, that was a privilege to be involved with him, obviously, because he is, when you say jungle and drum and bass, as far as the biggest ever producers, he will be always there. It was difficult to follow a Dillinger tune, weren't it, when you were playing out? Someone like Dillinger was a huge influence on people when he was at his most prolific. There are only really two kings of this music. Two poles, if you like. Dillinger and calibre. Because at both ends of that spectrum, everything in between is us. I've got my daughter of 17, nearly gonna be 18. She came in one time and said, Dad, they're playing some really crap tunes on the radio, but I found this tune, who's this tune there? And it was Dillinger. You know what I mean? It was nasty ways, and I'm like, rah! I had to tweet Carl and say, yo, Carl, my daughter's coming with blanging at this tune on her headphones, you know what I mean? <laughs> In Wormhole. At Russian Optical. They're still talking about it now. It's nearly 20 years later. It's one of the best drum and bass albums that has ever existed. But I don't think people realize how much other music Ed Rush and Optical made that same year. They put out one of the most timeless albums in 98, but also 1998 was Renegade Hardware. <laughs> I went to the end 
uh, for a few years before we actually got a night in there. And I walked in there and I was, I was blown away by the layout. There was no club at the time with that type of layout. The DJ booth was in the middle of the dance floor. And a lot of DJs describe it almost like a gladiatorial arena. <laughs> We used to literally every Friday go down to the end, which, like, in my opinion, what what is and was the best club, well, was the best club in the UK, and I don't think anything's ever going to top it. I mean, growing up then and listening, seeing people like your pioneers, like Andy C, the man who's with, like DJing right in front of you, and that sound system. I remember one time getting a two o'clock set at the end after Loxy and Too Shy, which at the time, that was the pinnacle. You know, you're going to come on then, you've got to deal with it. Probably Loxy, one of the tightest DJs I've ever come across. Loxy can fucking dark you out. Just don't, sometimes I wouldn't want to play after him. I'm like, oh, fuck it, I'm not playing after Loxy. Definitely don't want to play after Randall. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Andy, the club's empty now, you've left. Twat. The end was like a two hour set. And I used to, man, the amount of prep I used to do and dubs that I used to cut, and I used to be at home mixing, literally. If I was on the decks at like 1 a.m. or 2 a.m., I used to be at home mixing until midnight, like just learning the tunes and trying stuff out and go straight on the decks as if to say like, you know, like, cause it was all the same crew down there. It was like, right, I've got some beats for you this time. You know, I've got some, I got some war music and it's gonna go off. Just really, really beautiful memories of being in the middle of that rave. to 02, those four years, like you had the you had the, the virus boys doing their thing, Bad Company were doing their thing. It, it was just a good time. There was good music. There was a lot of different camps, and it was a good rivalry. That was very arms racy that era. Then it was like, oh, how do you make that? Or everyone was on the lookout for the new piece of hardware that could make the your bass sound weirder and twisted up. It's friendly rivalry, isn't it? I mean, but that's what's that's fuel to the fire. Do you know what I mean? It's like, it's not competition. It's like, wow, you've just upped the game with that tune. And we want to go back and we want to like, we, you know, we, we need to step up now. Because uh, next week, when we meet up down Music House, we want to play you a tune that blows your mind. Um, it was pretty much every week, unfortunately, Ed Rush and Optical were blowing everyone's mind. <laughs> Especially when they did Wormhole LP and uh, them days, it was, it was magic. Man. We weren't really thinking about where's this going to go or what's this going to do. We were literally just making music that we wanted to hear, that we liked. Music yeah. that sounded good to us at that moment, in that room, at that second. We didn't sit down and map out a plan and say, we're going to be, no. this is what we're going to do and it's going to sound like this. We were kind of hoping just if everyone didn't hate us afterwards, would be good enough. This production was out of this world and it was like, something brand spanking new like you'd never heard before and it was just mind-blowing but really I'd say uh, for Will and I it was it was conflict um, their tunes on, on, on predominantly on Renegade hardware but they released on a whole sea of labels their production was out of this world and just the attention to detail the groove the ruggedness, but it sounded clean. The, the mix downs at the time, it all just sounded amazing. And I think the conflict, Kamal and Rob Data are definitely right up there with one of the biggest reasons we got excited about production. Conflict were hugely um, sort of important to myself in terms of wanting to produce music. If you could name 10 producers that kind of change the scene, they'd be in the top 10. Obviously everyone knows the there was a fallout between us and Messiah, but um, take that away. Yeah, they, they were very good at what they've done. Even now, people still talk about them. They, they're legendary.
around the year 2000, um, Fabio, who, who is still the Don, has to be said, uh, he coined the term liquid for this soulful music, musical drum and bass. Now, I instinctively didn't like the term at first because for me that there was already there was an explosion and a kind of like influx of generic liquid tunes however thank goodness there were producers who stood out from the crowd like caliber like marcus intellects we carry on into 2001 the first signing of black sun empire so who are these guys they're dutch there's no Dutch drum and bass, but now there is. And Trace has started a label called Decipher. I really love that label, like the whole, the whole artworks, the artists they had on board, the way they kind of did the whole PR and the whole hype about it. And the difference about that, I think it was very internet centric. And in the early 2000s, it was, it, it was a lot of it was down to uh, the internet and the way that the internet started to revolutionize the way we consume music and talk about music and, and find music. AOL Instant Messenger, and you can literally see your heroes at the, at the end of the keyboard, like on the screen there, the future card had kindly given us a lot of AIM names. So we'd see like Dog Scott and Goldie and Andy C and like Matrix, and like wow, they were like, you know, buttons away. You could say yo to Andy, he might say yo, but and you're like, Andy C's reply. You know, it was just a constant exchange of information and it was new to us. So we'd spend hours a day just sitting online chatting to producers from all over the world who've got your aim handle. We had a music house, but it was in your own home. You could talk to people in America or in Spain or, or where, wherever and, and you, you started to realise there's a lot of people interested in making this music. Well, the best thing to happen to drum and bass was the world happened to it. Once England worked out that the world was making this music and you know once um, once it became more accessible via the internet and people releasing music by people from outside of the UK and you know it really opened up the, the sound of the music. Two thousand and one to that, that whole period, we had the scene was blessed with a, with a lot of big tunes, and it brought a lot of people in. I remember it was around that time where LK got really big, um, and there were some other tracks. I think Shimon and Andy, Body Rock, around that time as well. Um, you know, all these massive tracks that were getting a little bit more attention from outside of the drum and bass scene, and um, that was an interesting time. It was a good time for drum and bass. Body Rock was a magical night, all night studio session. Shim and I were just laughing, just like, is that any, I don't know, is it good? Is it weird? What, you know, literally we'd be playing it and we'd be laughing at how mad and different and I don't know, man. I mean, it got playlisted on Radio 1, which at the time was completely unheard of. Oh, I was really happy like to see those tunes, Char. Um they were made for the underground, for clubs, for pirate radio, for junglists and drum and bass heads. And for them to find success in the mainstream chart, I think was out of this world. That was like sort of one of the golden eras, I suppose, where you had like Andy C's tunes, but I think it's Body Rock came out around about then and you had Planet Dust coming out then and you had John B up all night coming out then. It was just like amazing, so many tunes. <laughs> But then obviously, you know, you had the whole Shy FX era as well. 
um, when he was doing his thing. You know, I got in with him, um, done a couple of tracks with Shirebrex as well, which is really good. MCs are a fantastic conduit for the DJs and helping that interaction with the crowd, you know, getting the party going. Maybe, you know, if the DJ's in a bit of a lull, pulling them through and getting getting the vibe across and also, you know, interacting with the crowd. Host, hosting, you know, sort of like, we're at the start of the night, Let's I'll take you all the way through the journey. You know, GQ used to do the whole of AWOL, the whole night, 10 till 10. Andy used to come and listen to me in Randall over by Paradise Club. Um, 93, 94, I think it was, when he was a little boy with long ponytail. He used to come over there to check me and Randall out, because Randall's the daddy. Kind of my strategy, I think, of MCing is I go in and I read what the situation is. If I go in and I'm working after Skibbity or them guys there, I know what I gotta go and do. If I'm going in and working after DRS and them guys there, I know what I gotta go and do. You just, I think when you understand music, do you know what I mean, from where I come from, you know what I mean? You know how to respect it. Absolutely. I wanna hear some fucking noise in it. What's going Where's the fucking noise? A good MC is everything to a drum and bass party. A bad MC, not so much. <laughs> I think, you know, it just comes from being around music as a as a younger, to be honest. When you've got that musical thing, I mean, I used to I started I started to learn to play piano when I was five years old, and then when I went to school as well, I was playing drums. I'm actually quite really good on the flute as well. People don't realise like flute, piano, drums. You know, I was a musical youth basically. I've been very lucky to work with amazing MCs in the in the DJ sets. I remember Stevie Hyper, like you know when. Sting at telepathy when I had a residency at telepathy. He's like, oh, this is new kid. I've got, I've had it. He sent me a tape and I think he's wicked. I'm going to try him on your set this week. And it was Stevie I could do. <laughs> then moments are like when, when he's going in full flow and you're like, what the, you know, you know, and so many hooks and so many really quiet, humble guy outside of doing the MC. And to me, MCs are an important part of it. You know, you know, some the people who don't like it. Fine, but there are people, if they weren't important, they wouldn't be here, would they? You know, look at something like SASAS, you know, you look at the grime scene. We had a lot of lot of good tunes on frequency, but if you can distill it into like one fantastic reason, out of frequency comes sub focus. People always talk about the scene being closed off. Every scene they say that. They only let so many people in and all this kind of rubbish and maybe in in in, in the late 90s, mid 90s, that there might have been some kind of truth in that, who knows, but I think we come through with a lot of other artists at the same time as us, us Noisier, Pendulum, Subfocus, um, all acts today who are still like working week in, week out. <laughs> The thing what I remember about Chasing State is they always had a vision of not just being pigeonholed as drum and bass artists. They said to me from the get-go, we want to do everything. And at, at the time, no one was doing it. So a lot of people looked at them like, oh, whatever, it's, it's a pipe dream. You know, you've got to take it to have chats off to like Chasing status and acts like that because like they've changed the game. And they've proved like if you've got a good drum and bass history, you can make any kind of music. So I became a pres one of the drum and bass team members at One Extra from the launch, so before it launched, and that was 2002. My show lasted five years, and 
in that time we achieved a real lot for drum and bass um, in terms of having the BBC back in as well. I mean, obviously one in the jungle had existed on Radio 1 for quite a while, then it became Fabio and Groove Rider. We didn't have to like go in there and have a set programme and we just went and just freestyled it. I never wrote down a show or what I was going to do in a show or anything like that. We just went and done it. Pirate style, so you know, this is all good. Favourite memory that's not hazy is one we show we recorded at my house and I've got loads of DJ. We've got Sub Focus, DJ Fresh, Goldie, Heist. They were all around my house sitting around and recording a show around my tables eating Christmas dinner. That was a pretty mental show. And then we just went into another room and started having a, a, a battle. It was quite bad. It was very weird, like, interviewing Groove Rider and Fabio on my show, knowing that they had the show before me. I, that was one of the most daunting things I've ever done. But amazing, and hearing some of, like, Groove's stories. When he told me, like, telling me the story about when he got slammed, and I think they, he rerounded it, like, four times or five times on Radio 1, which was amazing. But that was a massive part and time for the scene because that was when things were changing. I think in terms of the modern sound, it's got to be Pendulum. They just flipped d &B and how it's produced on, yeah, on its as, head as completely. Producers. As producers, yeah. Like, everybody's style kind of changed when they came into the fold. <laughs> sat next to Rob when he had Bacteria Remix playing in the computer. You know, like, so it's one thing to have, get the tunes finalised, but when you actually, when you actually can hear it coming out of the studio speakers and you're like, how are you doing this? Like, production levels were just on a, it was on another planet. You know, pardon the pun. That's a good clip. That's a good pun, isn't it? I didn't even mean that. I remember like another planet. I was like, wow, what? That bit where it switches halfway through, I was like, what even is that? Like, how do you even do that? Yeah. It, well, in our opinion, took drum and bass to like a different different place. And, you know, they, they changed the game as far as we're concerned. And like, you know, they're true pioneers of the, the scene, really. You know, they took digital music to another level. You know, people were just playing about with digital. A pendulum came in and said, yeah, this is what we do. And made a statement. <laughs> There was even altercations in cups where first generation with, pro with approach people like Pendulum accusing them of ruining their careers because they came with a whole nother knowledge of what sonic impact could mean. It really expanded who could make music. You didn't have to have a studio, you know, that cost you the price of an apartment. And I understand there's probably some resentment from those who um, made that outlay into hardware and spend all their money on it, but look at the quality of the music that came after that when it became more accessible. Two thousand and four, five, and six definitely one of my favourite eras of drum and bass. James Breakage making his like good dubby stuff. You had Digital making a lot of wicked tunes around that time. Um, all of Calibre's music was amazing and incredible at that time. We started working together in two thousand and four. Drum and bass was in a kind of mixed place. Uh, we'd sort of been through the hangover after the honeymoon, as in turn of the millennium. 
you know, I think drum and bass actually was in a pretty good place at the time, I think. You know, there were, sales were good. So, sales were good. Well, although they were starting to die, it was the, there was yeah. a transition taking at the place where it was much harder for producers to exist without DJing. DJing. When we look at vinyl sales in, in 05, I mean, for an example, in, in 2003, we could literally release anything on subtitles and sell between eight to 15,000 copies. And then, you know, everyone was screaming, oh my God, it's going downhill, like 2005 was like, it was getting hard to sell 5,000. MP3 culture, that's, that's when that all turned around, before it was dub plate culture. Then it was the case of people cutting dub plates, so you'd be given a DAT or, you know, a CD, and you'd have to take it to a place in um, London called Music House. <laughs> Oh man, stories from the cutting house. Well, the first story is that you go cutting house, you never ever take a camera in there. So there's not that much footage of what's going on in the music house. Uh, never ever move from your queue, don't matter how hungry you are. You can be hungry for days. You can be in there, once you get in your queue space, never move, because you'll lose that spot. So I was kind of, I had a love-hate of the dub plate days. You know, the dubs itself, I loved. The whole meeting up there and being part of that used to, Sometimes, I'm not the quietest of people, if you ain't noticed, so therefore, if somebody's giving an opinion about something that I don't agree with, rather than sit quiet and go, you know what, it's nothing to do with me, just sit there, well, you know, I'll get involved. I used to go there in my head, like, don't get involved in nothing. You know, just sit there, you're in a rush, but I can't help myself. The, the Music House days were amazing. Trying to get there really early so that I wouldn't be waiting all day, and you know, because if you got there late and then Groove Rider waltzed in and he's got his Radio 1 show later or something, you're like, oh no. He'd just walk in and he'd have a bag of DAT tapes and CDs. You'd know that you weren't getting seen for a long time. It used to be like a, a, a DJ's club, do you get what I'm saying? Our own little internal club where we just sit and talk about music and swap music and exchange. and. You know, that aspect of it is really lost. So yeah, Music House was like, it was like a community centre where you went to get inspiration, smoke some great weed, and hear all the latest tracks that all the other and DJs were cutting. a few of them as well, if you could. And everyone would be on the phone outside trying to call Dylan, just saying, uh, Groove Rider just turned up with his dat. Can we cut the track, please? We're like, nah, no, I think 2005, <laughs> 2005 was probably right at the end of that. That was it, when everyone started using CDs. So dub plates were great. They smelt nice, they were nostalgic, they cost a hideous amount of money. And uh, we never really delved into that world too much. While it may be sort of looked upon in an air of nostalgia, to me was detrimental to the progression of drum and bass. If you had to spend 35 to 50 quid on, on cutting a single record just to be able to play it, it just slowed the process of everything. And if that record was only available to sort of an inner circle, it was sort of reprimanding the advancement. It was stopping drum and bass being truly available to anyone. And if you could walk into a club and hear someone play a record that you couldn't buy, I can't see how that was beneficial in any way. It, it's not reggae, it's not sound systems, it's drum and bass. It's incredibly technical digital music made in a digital environment. And then you are dem the people were demanding that you use sort of decades old technology to perform it. It's not a question of vinyl versus CDs. It was a question of dub plates versus CDs. Because you were always, if you were playing stuff on vinyl, okay, if it's something you were playing for a long time, you're always, you want to be playing stuff that's not out yet. So the choice is dub plate or a CD, because if it's on vinyl, it's too old already. <laughs> I'd grown up watching Randall, Andy C, Hype, whoever. You know, I was going to clubs and sitting there like trying to get near anywhere I could watch them actually mix and like that was a big thing because it was just, it was all about vinyl to me. Then what was happening is I'm playing in clubs where 90% of the DJs now play CDs. You know, I used to spend, and this is the truth, anything between like a thousand and three thousand pounds a month on dub plates. And, you know, you turn up at a club where you've got a big poster with your face on the door, hype's there tonight, and you turn up, the local guy's on playing his CDs, and the, the crowd's kind of there, but really they're waiting for you. And you're there, all, you know, they'll, they'll start shouting your name a bit, and you know, like, ask when you want, when you are, you're gonna smash it. 
Then you go on and you're the man, you put on your first mix, because it's needles are jumping, you can't actually do the mix. So everything's jumping, you feel like a complete arsehole. And those kids don't go, yeah, what it is, the sound engineer didn't set it up. They just go, hey, shit, he can't mix, he's rubbish. I think 2006 was a, you know bit, was a bad mate? year. Yeah. I don't, uh, it was an, I mean, we started, we made some shit at some <laughs> points. I think that was when we done our Good Game album, which was horrific, yeah. if I'm honest. It was yeah, just not, yeah. we because we just was partying a lot. 2006, when we, we started med school, hospital had, had grown to the point where it was now approaching the edge of becoming a mainstream independent label. And I wanted, I wanted something with no pressure on it. Something where we could really experiment. Global Gathering 06 for Pendulum was a huge one. Um, we swapped sets with Frost, I think, and we played last. It was broadcast on Kiss. It was, you know, that was a big moment. Playing at Fabric, our first sort of real live show was at Fabric, um, again, 2006. And we seemed to play there quite often throughout 03 to about 08. And, um, you know, Fabric's a staple. It's been there since 99. It's guaranteed it's going to be full on a Friday and it's going to be drum and bass and it's going to be good. What was good about Fabric in London is, one, their policy is really towards underground music. Fabric has been the mother, the mothership. You know, a lot of co operates out of here and they're always trying to evolve it as well, which I like. So yeah, this is this is the club and the surroundings. I mean, it's such an excellent club. It's, you know, it's got the sound, it's got the look, it's got everything for a proper rave. It's four walls and a floor. There's no fancy lighting. It's gritty, the sound system's fat. Those four walls have spawned a hell of a lot of incredible careers. And I've met a lot of people talk about Fabric being the place that they had that moment. Hear someone play that tune, have an epiphany, turn to your friend and say, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. Go home and completely change and become focused on this. And not all of them went on to become producers and DJs. Some went on to become owners of big boy web, uh, websites to do with the scene. Some went on to become big promoters, agents, managers. It's an institution in, 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 in not just drum and bass, but UK music. <laughs> In 2007, I was a bedroom producer, and then I released this album, and kind of everything went crazy. And I went on tour, and the music, like so many cool artists out there, did fresh kind of music, like the digital revolution kind of thing. By 2007, when I was finally being sort of picked up, I built up to that moment for a while. I was working really hard, and at that time, I'd make a tune in a day or two, and. I did a few releases, a lot of people liked them, signed them, and then everybody else was like, have you got something for me? And a lot of labels I never thought I'd get signed to, they were like, have you got something? And because I was writing so fast, I was like, yeah. So it just, it went like that, and it was really fast. It was a super exciting time, you know, I was like in my early 20s, and uh, all of a sudden everybody cared, which was also quite unusual being Dutch in such a, an English music Scene, although I was really not the first in that sense. People starting to break that barrier down. So many places this music has traveled to, 
it no longer needs to be dependent of just a UK sound. Europe is definitely been somewhere which has taken this whole thing by the horns and have run with it and said, you know what, we get this. I mean, we don't only get this, but we're going to teach you guys a few lessons as well. Honestly, I had, I had no idea, but I, I know, I knew um, drum and bass was, you know, starting in the UK, etc. But by the time I was discovering drum and bass for myself, I, had, I, I, had, I didn't have the interest to look into, drum, into, into the UK side of drum and bass because I was hooked on the whole European side from the beginning. Like, um, yeah, noisier face, guys like that. For me, it was an, an era, I, I can't really define the, 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 the correct time span. What, for me, I was called the, the, the subtitles era. You know, when Noisy was starting out, Hubcap, that kind of shit. Oh, yeah. And uh, when, you know, Face, Hot Rock, and then Miss Enfrop came along uh, with Viper Fish and all that shit. It was just gold. Yeah. Gold. Big up TB on signing those people. I did put quite a, a big focus on actually signing non UK acts to sort of bring it through. You know, I, I had the first releases from like Noisy, from Phase. Um, and yeah, it was good times. Yeah, 2007 was an interesting year, really. Um, I remember at the time, Noisier were doing some break stuff. Um, I had actually hooked up with the guys from Aqua Sky. We ended up making a tune. Pendulum had a breaks track out as well. And yeah, it was it's interesting. I think people were starting to experiment more. I think Zinc around that time as well. He was making more sort of like breakbeat kind of stuff. Obviously, Zinc's an absolute legend from, from writing seminal tunes like Super Sharp Shooter to doing different genres like 138 Trek, um, Funky and Go DJ, and basically started up this bingo imprint, which is fundamentally Zinc just doing what he does, but a slower tempo. And at the time, there was a whole load of like oh, Zinc's not making, he's selling out, he's doing this. And the reality is that making tunes at 140 isn't selling out, just making tunes at 140, but it was much cliquier then, even more than now. And he got a lot of stick for it, but he also wrote some of the, the biggest tunes in the country. I think the dubstep movement is inevitable to come off the back of 140 BPM bass music because dubstep has had lots of elements from drum and bass with the bass noises, the kind of levels of production, the fat drums, but just kind of slower and it had all the kind of production levels and quality that previous music might not have had. When dubstep came around and started doing, you know, this sort of cool bass line stuff, which is what I came from to begin with, you know? I mean, like, uh, how f what's the difference between an early Scream tune and an early Johnny L tune, you know? I, I was excited by it, but for a, a while, to begin with, I was like, oh, these guys are shit producers. Fucking hell, man. Like, learn, learn how a compressor works, and then we'll talk again. When dubstep was here, it was like, I remember people coming to me in raves in, in Oklahoma going, yeah, fuck German bass, man. Dubstep's in, man. I'm like, wow, really punch you that in the face. Happened, you know, when dubstep first come to the forefront, at the same time, people like Chasing Status, Sub Focus, Wilkinson, um, Pendulum, you know, DJ Fresh, and they all became today's pop stars. Chart success, and especially chart singles, was something we never thought about. We made albums. We weren't, the record companies would say, you need singles, and we'd be like, we're just gonna make an album, pick what you want. So anything that kind of got um, popular in a mainstream sort of crossover, like I guess one of our tracks, Tarantula, it's about going to a funeral. You know, Propane Nightmares is a, about a cult. They weren't um, targeted at a sort of mainstream audience. That's just how it worked out and was bewildering to us at the time. Our first top 10 was with Plan B, End Credits, 2009. And that song was all about dying. 
I think if we'd have, we, not just Chasing Status, if we'd have all tried to make music to get on the, on the radio and on the chart, we would have failed and it would never have had the opportunities that it's had. You can see when people make tunes that aren't like them for the radio and it doesn't work and it doesn't chart or anything. It happens in drum and bass and has happened over the years where you can always find some wicked music and excellent music, but there are just these little time periods that kind of pop up every now and again where you think, bloody hell, I love this. <laughs> it's not changed the game for me in terms of drum and bass. I'm watching you. That time was just like nothing ever before and it was just bringing in all these different influences and, and they were making stuff that was kind of like electronica, well it was really, um, slowing it down, bringing in all of this musical stuff and I was just like, wow, what is this? This is incredible. It was just the whole movement. Um, they were doing Room 3 at Fabric. They asked me to be a resident there, um, which I'll be eternally grateful for as well. It gave me a chance to play other styles of music. Two thousand and ten, it was. I guess it was a bit of a game changer for us because I mean, we've all, we all like the bad company stuff with stuff we you know it was. Yeah, we used to love that. We used to love it. We used to you know, we still look up to Fresh as a, an amazing producer, and he he we just got in touch and he was interested in what we were doing. So I remember at the time we went down to his. Um, he used to have a studio on like a riverboat. Um, mm. yeah, where was it on Ch near Chiswick? Ch Chiswick, yeah. And so we used to go down there and like you'd be in the studio and in t probably a room not much bigger than this and he would have the tunes up so loud yeah. you couldn't talk to him. Like you had to literally shout in his ear and then you'd see a duck swim past the window. <laughs> it was quite a surreal experience. But, yeah. you know, Dan showed a, a, a lot of support and, you know, he really did have, a, have our backs from, you know, day one and, and so did Adam, Adam F as well. I mean, Breakbeat Chaos was still really strong then. Um, yeah. And, yeah, kind of the artists that we both always... I mean, there's a lot of art, a hell of a lot of artists that we look up to and, and inspire us, but I th still think at that time it was Adam F from Fresh. People like DJ Fresh, I've always got to take my house because he's always changing stuff. His success kind of speaks volumes, really. Do you know what I mean? He's always up for trying something different, whether that's going down a commercial route or whether that's doing something that's a bit out there and kind of strange. But I think that's what we really respected. You know, I've seen Fresh take a lot of flag, but he's one of the only guys who's actually walked the line, truthfully within the game of DMB. When into the pop thing, broke Rita Ora, made her a worldwide star. Right? Broker. Still plays fucking music. Why? Because he's fucking good. I'm not particularly a DJ, to be honest. I'm more of a producer. More of an alchemist that puts great sound together. You know, catch me in the wrong day, I fucking play, I can't mix a fucking salad. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> play, a good, play a few tunes though. If you catch me in the right fucking mood, maybe. Do you know what I mean? There's people that can really do that. I mean, the Randalls of this world, the Andy C's of this world, you know, that can really fucking roll out. Spirit, Spirit can fucking roll out. Really roll out. Turn me inside out. Same as Storm. Some people have great selections, others don't. My favourite guy to listen to is Break because of the ebb and flow of his sets, you know, because of the style he represents and because of how understated he is at times and he can make the most sort of like in someone else's set, a common roller. Just go off. Yeah, he's like the antithesis of what DJing has become for a lot of people in terms of lowest common denominator, emphasis entirely on the drop. Literally just flat out all night and yeah. all kinds of gimmicks as well, with yeah. cages and sort of, <laughs> sort of um, I'm not going to call anyone out here, do you know, but you know, hands in the air, crowd surfing, I mean, what we fucking hell was going yeah, on? Yeah, I mean, I, I, mean? Wouldn't, I wouldn't have actually got into it if people, if Groove Rider and Fabio were going around doing all that dancing. Crowd surfing. Crowd surfing, yeah, I, I, I probably would have 
I would have thought differently. <laughs> I, I said, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, it was like, because Groove would be up there, Spliff hanging out of his mouth, just looking <laughs> bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And just mean. Yeah. I've even seen him knock out the sound like, guy, like just bam. <laughs> just, but, you know, he's yeah. not, it, it weren't about him, but yeah. it kind of was, if that makes yeah. any sense. Do you know what I mean? It there was, was no sort of like, sort of showman sort of thing going on there. Yeah, yeah. I said yeah, the other day, mate, if Fabio starts double dropping and I'm fucking finished, mate. <laughs> I'm giving it up. No, look, straight face, giving it up. Yeah, maybe it's interesting. Maybe there's not as many um, DJs with unique styles nowadays, you know, in a sense of like a DJ having an identity where you can tell it's that DJ on due to maybe the way that they'll mix or blend a tune or the way that, you know, that it will always get through the breakdown and then it'll be a lovely smooth ride at the end to, to segue into the next tune or whether it's going to be like, Boom, 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 hammers at all double drops, or whether it's going to be cutting in and out. I think, I think DJs have a fucking massive responsibility to be dutiful. I love the fact that when, I'm, when we're there and Andy's playing, Andy will still have to draw out a tune on us. He knows he does, don't you? He knows he will. He'll have to draw a tune out, and he will. And he'll fucking draw it out. Executioner, he'll draw out some proper fucking DB. Love hearing a fresh tune get drops. I love it. A man that can still roll out a fucking tune and hurt people. SS still going strong, SS man. SS still going strong. Touring the world more than anyone, man. It's absolutely it's, crazy. It's nuts, it's man. It doesn't, nuts. it doesn't get a mention. Like, the guy works so hard. Yeah, and, non-stop. And he, and he ran one of the biggest, most influential drum and bass labels ever. He's signed every artist. He's signed something pretty much from every big artist the last 20 years, man. It was just that like every release that came out was just mm. awesome. Mm. And even if it wasn't something you necessarily liked, it was still cool. It still sounded different. Every time I DJ, there was fresh music to play that was great. Subfocus was putting out records. Chase and Status was putting out amazing records. TC was putting out amazing records. Guys like the prototype started to, you know, to, to send us tunes. I messaged Aim. Fresh on AIM every single day for a year. No, like he was relentless. Every, He's really good. At I that. just bombarded people with stuff until <laughs> Andy. He was really good at doing it to Andy yeah. as well. <laughs> and eventually, man, like these people are listening to your stuff just because they don't tell you. But it turns out a lot of them have been playing our stuff for months before we even know about it. Through 2010, 11, 12, you would hear the music first, and you didn't know who it was, like Lodestar and Simon. Based on Smith, and you'd hear the Rudimental Records, and you'd hear Fresh's record, and I, you know, I heard Rita always uh, voice first, so I didn't know who it was. So when I found out it was Fresh, so I mean, I was kind of like half surprised, but not that surprised. I was kind of like relieved. People were involved in majors that grew up on Jungle Drum and Bass, so their understanding of it was a lot better. Therefore, if you see in the second half of the history or whatever you want to name, there's been a lot of successful pop acts, like D&B acts that have crossed over, whereas back then it didn't really happen. I would say that like, the pop thing can be a lead into it. Well, that's a load of nonsense. Man. You're not going to fucking find a debut album by listening to that shit, are you? You're not going to find fucking Rolled Into One by Foltec by listening to that shit, are you? So I, I argue about it, I argue with that very, very strongly about stuff like that. I would never want to criticise any subgenre of drum and bass, like everything has its place and I like it all pretty much. Um, and I've always felt like that, like right from, you know, the, the kind of sound that would get criticised when I first started was the sort of Aphrodite kind of jump up sound, like people were saying it was cheesy and poppy, like, you know, the remixes of the hip hop stuff. But I used to play that at university because it was a gateway, you know, you're trying to get people into drum and bass. So play things that are not the super hard stuff all the time to get the girls dancing and get people that aren't into drum and bass dancing to it without them realising. And you know, the same can be said now for Wilkinson and Sigma and things that people criticise for being too poppy or charty. They get people into drum and bass. I totally embrace 
even stuff I'm not into that's real charity and poppy, if it's bringing a wider audience in that it's will then good. get into yeah. what we're about, then that's a good thing. I wasn't going to get into drum and bass coming from my jazz background, going straight into no U-turn or Source Direct or Hidden no. Agenda. I got in through beautiful ambient pad strings, little bouncy 808s, rolling brakes, Bookham, good looking records, all that stuff was, you know, how I got into it. It's time to elevate the sound. Say 2013, 12, maybe just before. It was an amazing time for music where you just go in and say, I'm going to play some music, listen to it, you know? And that's ultimately what you want to do. I remember talking to the Ivy, Ivy Lab guys about three years ago and they were like doing this thing and it was like, we do shows together and they play it and I'd be like, oh, I don't know if people like it, but it's really good, but like you're brave to play that much of it. And, you know, we started to play more and more of it, and obviously they, they're, they're the champions. As far as I'm concerned, they're very much the champions of it, along with people like Alex Perez, Darren Debridge. I think he's a, he's a big proponent of uh, being experimental within drum and bass. When I made Dead Nine and Jester before that, and Natty Dread before that, and I think there's Wise Man before that, there's like loads of, I just see it as part of making drum and bass. I don't sit there, um, thinking about what I've done afterwards, really. It's just a fun thing. I just got a few drums together and it progressed into that. I, I experiment, I mess around. I, I didn't think, oh, you know what, that's, that's a, like a halftime thing, or this is that. You know, it's, it's just a track. Yeah, I mean, halftime is definitely really big at the moment. Beatsy, you know? I mean, halftime's been big. I remember uh, Johnny L halftime tune in 96. <laughs> But, I mean, the Beatsy thing's completely taken off and it's really cool and I like it as well, but it's converging into one sound. It's fairly easily defined. There's also a danger with the beat stuff that it becomes beer strokers music. That is what 2014 to 2016 is for me. It's about letting our older generation fans know that we're still here and this younger generation of fans know, do you know what? We didn't just come yesterday. Obviously, Ronnie Size, um, he took it from jungle to the mainstream, really, but still just kept it, I mean, it kept it massively credible still. There's room for everyone. I believe that everyone should, who's being a part of it, if they want it, they should have a piece of it because it's great out there. You know, like, who doesn't want to go and play in front of like 20,000 people at Glastonbury on the main stage? Who doesn't want to do that? That's the biggest party in the world. So I mean, so, you know, don't let it just be because some A&R man out there, you know, had the great idea to do this. Because if you are specifically writing drum and bass music with the mindset of wanting it to be commercially viable, it's going to not end up sounding like a drum and bass record or it's going to end up being corrupted by your vision. When you look at this scene and all the people that have helped to take this scene to where it is, you should understand that what you're actually playing on the radio is a segment of what the rest of it is. And the only reason why that, then that, when that music will be credible is when I'm fucking dead when that music that they're making is going to be incredible. Because I feel strongly about that. Gentrified drum and biber bollocks. Mainstream popularity in drum and bass and chart positions in drum and bass, I think it's awesome, cool. You know, Rudimental had a charting drum and bass tune that has a trumpet solo in it. I don't know how the hell they pulled that off. Song-based drum and bass versus cynically created pop drum and bass. A bit like The View by, by DRS and LSB, you know, amazing song, just like should easily be number one, you know, and it, and 
in people who knows hearts, it is number one. And that's the thing. Uh, Sigma featuring Take That. Now, that's not done through love. It's a kind of construct. It's, it's a, a functional process to make money. It's not done because it's what you want to do and you love doing it. It's not like we set out to kind of, um, you know, we, it wasn't like there, were, there was a hit list of people for us to work with. But, you know, as we progress and as like we get bigger with the music we're making, you know, the artists we're working with get bigger. And, you know, I think for us, if the music's good, it's, it's, you know, it speaks for itself. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you make. I mean, we wouldn't ever want to compromise what we were doing just to work with one of those acts. You know what I mean, and for us, it feels like a, a Sigma track following on from the other tracks that we've done. So, you know, from from our perspective, that's why we kind of did it, and it feels feels good. I wish I could make a drum and bass record that was like really commercial that would like cross over. It's never going to happen. You might get a little bit of radio play on Radio Six. Great. That's all I need. I remember really City Life never went in the chart. It was like something like in the top 30 or something. You know, in today's terms, that's a real disaster. It doesn't matter, does it? It was, it was voicing something. This is one of the downsides of pop drum and bass is that young producers see that as an entry point. However, a lot of people will always be making anti-establishment music. What I find in the last few years, which is fantastic, is the underground, you know, like if you look at other genres of music, especially in the UK, British born ones, where they, they're born out of the underground, they become big, then all the, the artists within it at the top end go on to have pop success or commercial success. And then what happens is everybody leaves the underground, like they fuck it off. And then that's fine when you're having commercial success, but as soon as commercial success disappears and can be very fickle, in the end it's gonna die. Now, without an infrastructure on the underground, the whole scene dies with it. You know, if you look when Garage, Garage was as big as you could get. But when it died, it died like overnight. Same with Dubstep, when it died over, it died overnight. Every few years you get another genre to come in, it's huge, and we get kind of sidestep, oh, what, you still doing it? But our music is because we've got an underground infrastructure. You're in this thing together. Neither one of us pretend. always moving, it's always going forward in a positive direction, more and more talents coming through, the more global we become, the more the music is spreading, the more talented producers come in, there's more room for people to come in and change the music totally, like what Deebridge has done, like what Dub, Dub Physics did when he brought in all of the other influences. The success that we see now and the ubiquity of d &B on the radio, you go out to the festivals, you know, we're in Ibiza every week. And it's, go and it's going off. Them foundations are laid by the entire scene. Everybody influences everybody and everybody's laid the foundations for the success of drum and bass today. And I have to say this, because this is one of my favorite things to rant about, but drum and bass is never fucking cool, right? It's always the bastard child of dance music. One of the most important things about drum and bass longevity is that it's that sort of bastard child of dance music. If you're getting all the love, people are gonna get, you're gonna get sick of it eventually. It was room three music. And for me being into punk rock, that was where I was gonna be. I wasn't gonna be in room one. I was like, where's the underdogs? Where's the DIY guys? Where's the guys that are being told constantly your scene is dead? I wanna be part of that. To get into it, you have to care about the music and you're proud to be involved in something that you know is so cool and so awesome and different and you're not like 
in a you're not following some fashion and you know that's going to change you're, you're into something that's really meaningful and different and interesting and creative and and not like sell outy cheesy crap it's been around for such a long time and there's been so many sort of prolific producers coming through the scene and keep coming through you have acts also that break into the commercial world and make the sound even bigger to a bigger audience so mm. it's kind of like you know occasionally an act will break through and you know suddenly you'll get a whole different audience listening and hopefully coming to the drum and bass clubs There's a schizophrenia and a duality in drum and bass. It, it's one of the hardest types of music to make well, but if you, do, if you do make it well, I think the underground nature of it keeps people really together. Um, it's, it's really funny watching drum and bass, how it's withstood the test of time and other genres haven't. Drum and bass, we're just there. It's, a, it's actually a much bigger industry than people r realise. No one's been holding it hostage. Like, obviously some artists have been signed to majors over the years, but the music is so radical um, that it can't be contained. It's always been underground and always will be underground. Uh, it kind of, it was built up from people that has nothing really, that created these weird and wonderful new sounds. We're unique, the tempo, the energy, the vibe. It's, you know, it's, um, there's no other music out there at our tempo. It's not been assimilated by 4-4. You know, pretty much every other genre ever, and I've said this all along, every other genre, sooner or later, you go out and it'll be doom, doom, doom with the, with the influences. But we, we've not, we are, we stand apart for that. And um, like I've, I said, I said to my agent years ago, and I said to people, I was like, just chuck us on them stages at the festivals and you watch it rip this shit. <laughs> you watch people go nuts. And that's what's happened. Do you know what I mean? And like with the success of the artists that we've had coming through and with the, with the success that it's enjoyed now, pulls everybody up. It's like a big ladder, isn't it? Them big tunes, whether, whether, whether the underground of the scene is into them or not, it's like a rope ladder that pulls up everybody in every facet. Um, you know what I mean? And it brings more and more people into the scene. And everybody has to get into a scene somewhere. There's always a next gang that's getting into it. You know, whether it be the same sort of sound that was there before, I don't know, but there's always something else and then somebody else coming through and pushing the boundary that little bit further. So hopefully it's still continue because that's what keeps me involved it's not like the same as it was because like back in the day back in the early days it was just like uk productions but now the productions are coming from everywhere in the world and that's changed the whole thing it's opened up even more so we're going to be here for a while i do hope young kids come up and show the old ones what's possible and I don't know. I, I, there's a happy future for us, of course, and uh, I think there's too many people, cool people, uh, um, honest people, loyal people, and uh, uh, too many great minds out there. So I see it very positive, and uh, yeah, we'll see, we'll find out. I never like to predict the future. I just kind of go with the flow and see where it takes me. The things that I'd like to see happen with the scene itself, in terms of inclusion on lineups, uh, I'd like to see more women be supported. I'd like to see a mixture of cultures on lineups as well. I think the way it's become now, when you look at some label rosters, you just see one type of person. And that's not what attracted me to this music. 
I fell in love with it and going out because I saw all these different people around me. Different cultures, different ethnicities, different ages, different sexualities. Everybody just coming together and enjoying the music. There is something else now to happen. In fact, I think right now we're at a point again where we can really break it out if we want to. Beats is a really interesting sort of thing at the moment. It will go other places as well, but it really leaves some space, I think, at the moment for someone to be invented within it. So, we'll see. It's being videoed. We'll see whether I'm right or wrong. <laughs> well, we'll have this interview in another 20 years, you know. Well, I've got no hair left, then I'm walk walking in on a walk, it? but the passion's still there. And it is, it's that, that rawness. There isn't a future. You know that. And you know why there isn't one? Because what you do today creates tomorrow. And that's the attitude of what culture does. It doesn't give a fuck about tomorrow. We can't do anything. I think the youth will just do it. They just do it themselves. You know, they, they, they dictate what's happening, what's cool, what's what's the trend, what people are in, what, what they're into, you know. You can try all you like to, to push a certain sound, to push a certain this. If, if, if the kids aren't into it, they're not into it. And I think the, the beauty about Jungle is it's authentic. And when it's authentic, when it's genuine, and when it's, you know, from the heart to be cheesy, when it's real, that is what's enticing and attractive. Not just in Jungle drum and bass, in any genre. If you just do it properly because you want to do it and you love it, and, you can, and you, you can hear that, you can hear that. And that is what will attract people to be part of this culture. The drum and bass crowds really like drum and bass and that's what's amazing about them. And that's something you cannot, uh, you cannot ignore. And that's one of the things that makes being a drum and bass DJ, label owner, producer, whatever, amazing because the people who love your music, they really, really fucking love it. And that's really, really special. As soon as, I mean, it's like a cliche, but if you're in with Roman bass, you're almost in for life with yeah. this kind of genre. Yeah, definitely. And people are very passionate about it. And uh, they're true, like, I mean, I can relate to that. It's still, I love it. Mm. And uh, yeah. Just the forward thinking nature of the producers as well is just driving it a lot. I think people are constantly trying to, well, not outdo each other, but outdo themselves and just push something new forward. It's, it's underground, it's gritty, it's something that London's never produced before. It's never fallen off, you know, and, and because it's, it's so underground, it always just reinvents itself. You know, there's been a garage, there's been funky house, you know, there's hip hop and stuff like that, but nothing compares to the actual energy and, and the feeling, you know what I mean, of just, um, just the beats, the bass, the breaks, you know, nothing doesn't really compete to that. This music, for us, always like makes you, it's, it's a physical reaction as well. You can see people scrunching their faces and nodding quickly and you get it, you're on the same kind of vibe, it just touches you somewhere else. And I think, you know, drum and bass, Jungle did that to me, did that to Will, did that to us. People ask me, What's, why are you doing what you do? And I, I say, I want to bring beautiful music into the world that didn't exist before. And that's not just my own music, that's music by our artists. Drum and bass to me is a refuge, um, a passion, an obsession, and an undying love. Drum and bass is my life. Drum and bass to me is everything. Drum and bass to me, at one point I would have said everything, quick as a flash. Drum and bass is life. Drum and bass to me is pretty much my life. It has been for the last 25 years, and I don't see it changing at the moment. <laughs> you know, it's been 
18 years since I started buying records and since I started being involved in drum and bass and um, I think it's better than it's ever been and I'm even more stoked now than I was the day I worked out what it was. So there you go. Thank you drum and bass. To me, drum and bass is everything. It permeates every minute of every day. You know, drum and bass, it's, um, I don't know, it's a, it's a life's work. It's a mad thing, and it? it's beautiful, you know, it's beautiful. <laughs>